Yesterday I was uh, talking about two different paradigms, two theological paradigms, and I know that sounds sort of abstract, but I tried to make it a little more uh, practical by two different illustrations. I had an egg uh, that is, as a, as a kind of image of what the self could be like under one paradigm, and this is not the one I agree with, uh, but if you think about an egg, it's entirely self-contained, and if it goes bad, then it's the, the fault is within the egg itself, not from anything from outside. Uh, and so if, if you're totally self-contained and bounded, because the shell is like a boundary, keeps everything out, then your thoughts, your feelings, your desires all originate within you and your individual human nature. And so in this view, we have a sinful human nature. And when you're saved, you receive the forgiveness of God and God sees you as if you were Jesus. And I put the egg in a golden bag with a picture of Jesus on it to show you that God just sees you as if you had changed. And maybe over time, the course of your whole life, there's a very slow change and the gold sort of seeps into the egg or something. Uh, but, you know, and that's progressive sanctification in this view. But it really isn't complete in this lifetime. You'll only see deliverance from sin when you're in heaven with Jesus. Uh, and I don't believe that this is the correct way of understanding Scripture, not least because Romans 6 talks about how we have died to sin. Well, if I live my whole life and I have a rotten nature inside me and all my thoughts and feelings come from this rotten, corrupt nature, I'm not dead to sin. If I'm sinning a thousand times a day, and even my best uh, actions are corrupted by sin, and this is what I was taught by Reformed professors at the seminary I went to, every good deed is really corrupt, uh, then how is it that I'm dead to sin? How is it that I'm delivered? I'm not even sure that I'm forgiven. I'm not even sure I can forgive myself if I'm like that or what that actually means, uh, except for maybe that God isn't going to send me to hell when I die. Uh, that's about the limit of salvation. The other paradigm I brought up was the image of the sponge and how a sponge absorbs a liquid. And I had the uh, I put a, in a jar of black liquid, I put the sponge first to symbolize our uh, uh, indwelling and domination by the spirit of error, the spirit of Satan. And we expressed his spirit. And John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil and his desires you do. And so we're really doing the desires of another, but we think we're just ourselves. And so the sponge is open to the outside, open to being invaded a way that an egg isn't. Uh, and then I took the sponge and dipped it in a jar with bleach in it, and it, it purified the sponge. It, not, it purified me of my sins. My sins were washed away. It purified me of a consciousness of sh sin, the sense of shame and self-hate and awareness of sinfulness that is the result of 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 being operated by Satan. And then finally, what it also symbolized my participation in the body death of Jesus and how the agent of sin, Satan himself, the spirit of sin, was cast out of my body and I died to his spirit. Uh, and so then I had a third jar and I put myself and, and put the sponge into a jar with green liquid in it, you know, symbolizing my union with Christ and that I had a new spirit that was put into me because that's what Ezekiel 36, the promise of the new covenant talks about, how I will put a new spirit in you and cause you to walk in my ways. And that's the promise that this other paradigm neglects completely is that we are given a new spirit and the old spirit is removed. Uh, and, and so we, it, it's not only that we can walk in his ways, he will cause us to walk in his ways. So we're not like the rotten egg, we're like the sponge. And a sponge is sort of, is sort of another way of uh, Norm's image that we are vessels, we contain 
uh, a spirit and express a spirit, uh, we are not, the self is not evil in itself. And uh, Louis had posted on Facebook yesterday questioning the whole idea of dying to self. Well, how can I die to self? Scripture doesn't talk about that. We die to sin. We die to the law. But we don't die to self. The self is not the evil thing. It's what the self contains. So that's just a brief summary of what I was sharing about yesterday. I said a lot of other things about propitiation and expiation, but I won't go into that now. But I want to talk about uh, some phrases or words that are seen as really supporting this idea that we're just a rotten, corrupt self, like the bad egg, but they really don't. And those phrases, like the phrase, the old man, and Christians believe, oh, well, I still have an old nature or an old man. Uh, another, phrase, another word that's often seen, well, flesh. Well, the NIV translate, or used to translate in many cases, flesh as sinful nature or sinful human nature. So some Christians think, well, the Bible says it right there. Uh, and I think that's an incorrect translation. Uh, and I, just so some of you may not know me, I did my doctoral dissertation on Romans 7 and 8 and talked about uh, the meaning of flesh and sin in Romans 7 and 8, so I'm not just sort of making this up out of the blue. I spent six years uh, in a university in England researching this. Anyway, uh, so does, uh, let, let's start with the old man uh, or old nature, which actually I don't really like old nature as a translation. The word is literally old human being. Uh, and there are four verses uh, where it is mentioned uh, by Paul, and it's mentioned really only by Paul, or three verses and one uh, that's very important for understanding it. I'd like to start first with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that anyone is in union with Christ, when you see in Christ, you can take it as in union with Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Your spirit doesn't merge into his spirit, but you're joined to him in a covenant marriage union. And uh, so, and inseparable unless, of course, you apostatize. And so if anyone is in union with Christ, he is a new creation. Okay. What that means is it doesn't mean you're a bad egg wrapped up in a gold wrapper or put in a gold bag and God sees you as if you were Jesus. To me, when I say that something is a new creation, he's made something new. It's not the, he actually clarifies it. The old has passed away. That doesn't mean the old continues on and 90% uh, you're 90% old and you're gradually getting, you know, the next year you're 89% old and then by the time you die, maybe you're only 26% old man. No, the old has passed, the new has come. I think it's very clear what he's saying there and that uh, not to, if we don't believe that, then we're in disobedience to God and calling God a liar. You see, that's why I think that this other paradigm is really calling God a liar. Not only they deny the promises of the new covenant to put a new spirit and a new heart in us, they're saying we're partly an old creation or even mostly an old creation. No, we're a new creation. Now, another verse uh, is Colossians 3, 9. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with its practices. So it's something we did in the past, and we have put on the new, ver it's a new self in verse 10, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, by bar barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, and this is the real kicker, but Christ is all and in all. He's saying Christ really is the new man inside you. And not only that, he is all of it. Yes. He is all. 
And he's in all. He's in everyone who is part of God's people, who's truly a believer, but he is everything in everyone within God's people. Not to say that he's anything sinful, but what that means is the old has gone, the new has come. Uh, let's turn to another passage. Ephesians 4.22. Uh, actually, I will start with Ephesians uh, 4.21. Just one minute, let me call that up. Assuming that you have heard about him, this is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now that certainly sounds like we still have an old self or an old man or an old nature. Uh, how it's corrupt through deceitful desires. So that seems to say we have an old nature that is corrupted and has deceitful desires. But actually that's a misreading of what it's saying there. The, what is, and, and this is a case where uh, it is necessary to look at the Greek. To put off your old self and to put on the, or put on the new man. Uh, the tense of it, you see, we don't, we, when, it, this is an infinitive, uh, but we don't have different tenses for infinitives. So infinitive is to be, to run, to something. And, but in Greek, a present infinitive in the present tense means to do something repeatedly or continuously. In another tense called the aorist tense, we don't have it in English, it means to do it once, one time. And can you guess what tense this is in? It's in aorist. It's one time. It, it's saying the same thing as Colossians 3.9. And virtually all scholars believe Colossians and Ephesians were written at the same time. So he didn't mean two contradictory things. Uh, uh, he meant the same thing. He's, he, you were taught to put off the old man. Well, when did you do that? When you received Christ. When you were baptized, it's talking about conversion. It's not talking about something you repeatedly or continuously do. It's talking about a one-time event that when you were saved and baptized, you put off the old humanity, the person you used to be. And I would say, based on other ver verses, the person you used to be when you were indwelt by the spirit of Satan and operated by him. You put that off, and you put on the new man, the new man who is Christ, the Christ who is all in all, who is everything and everyone. And he's the one created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He doesn't give you a new human nature separate from Christ any more than there was an old nature that was separate from Satan. The old man is you operated by Satan, you in union with that spirit. The new man is you in union with Christ. And that's who you are. Now you can walk as if you still were the old man. You can be deceived into thinking you're separate from Christ and Satan will seize the opportunity to take control of your body and act out all sorts of sins. But it's not who you are. Even if you do it, you don't lose your sanctification because you're deceived and Satan acts out through you. So even if I were to sin a thousand times today, and I'm not saying I am or that I will do that, but even if that were true, I'm still entirely sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now how is that? that that's just a complete, seems like a complete contradiction in terms how can I possibly say that I am entirely sanctified because Christ is my sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Uh, and I am, in my spirit, I am perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, when I say that, I don't necessarily mean my behavior is perfect. It could be that 
my mind, it, it, Satan pulls me off the truth, uh, and I listen to him, and I believe what he says, and in my behavior, it ends up manifesting him because I get deceived. That does happen. That can happen. Uh, it doesn't have to happen, but it can happen. But I don't lose. The, the spirit union with Christ is not broken because I believe Satan's lie. But really, the only way, apart from apostasy, the only way a Christian can sin is through deception. And that really gets back to the only power that Satan has over a believer over the, you know, it is really through deception. Uh, so an, a final verse about old man I'd like to look at is in Romans 6. Uh, I will start with 6.5. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall certainly be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Okay. He says the old man was crucified with him. The, the person I used to be was crucified with him. Now, as far as I know, anything that's crucified is dead. Not only that, he said that we were buried with him in baptism in verse, uh, what was it, baptized into his death and buried with him in verse 4. Now, unless you really believe that, the, well, that, uh, that the old man was buried alive and is still living <laughs> after having been crucified and buried. I, I don't really see how you can interpret that in any other way than to say, you are no longer the old man. There, it just simply is not possible. You cannot be the old man. The only way you can act out the old man is to believe that you still are or that you are separate from Christ and you act as if you were still the old person. So it's only through deception. And this is talking, I focused on the blood mainly yesterday, but here this is about the body death of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is about how Christ, we were put into Christ on the cross, and we entered into Christ uh, through faith and, and through the image of baptism. Baptism is a physical image that shows how not we were included into Christ's body, soul, and spirit. And to show us that we were crucified, dead, crucified, and buried with him so that the body controlled by Satan would be brought to nothing and we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see, not only we were put into Christ, but we were joined to Satan. And so Satan... Sin, the spirit of sin, was put into Christ on the cross. And when Jesus' body died, the old spirit of sin went out. You know, as people have made the point of death is separation. And so it, it's sort of like a, a filter. Satan got filtered out of our humanity in his death. Uh, so that when we rose with Jesus from the dead... We were joined then to a new spirit, the spirit of life. And so now it's not Satan's law of sin and death that operates us. It's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in union with him. So it's very important to understand this body death of Jesus Christ because it's how we go from being the old man to being the new man. You can't be the old man and the new man at the same time. You are one or the other. The old is past, the new has come. Uh, scripture, and you know, this is one of the things that when I was studying in seminary and you know, the theologians there would teach me uh, that first paradigm and I'd think, but you're not paying attention to the scriptures. What about these passages that talk about this? And it's like they would just gloss right over them or not discuss them. Uh, or try to explain them away, and it's, but it says the old is past, the new is come. Now, I didn't argue with them. I just eventually stopped taking systematic theology and doctrine classes because I, 
this is this is really not of any value to me. Uh, you know, I was I was fine when we were talking about the doctrine of the Bible and the inspiration of Scripture and how Scripture is divine revelation. I, I agreed completely there. Then we started to get into the doctrine of man and doctrine of sin. It's like this really doesn't fit what Scripture says. And these were brilliant men. You know, people that smarter than, much smarter than I am, you know, when, when they were talking about doctrine of scripture, etc., but got to doctrine of man and sin, it was like they were blind or there were scales on their eyes, you know, that they were locked into a paradigm that they were taught by St. Augustine and by Luther and Calvin and the Westminster Confession, because it was a reformed seminary, you know, you know, you don't question the Westminster Confession. You know, that's the summary of what Scripture teaches. And it's like, well, why? Why do you make a new tradition? It's like a new Catholic tradition made out of Calvin and Westminster. It just, no, I, I could not accept that. So, well, that's because I had a kind of, I had... An inner knowing. I didn't yet know that I knew, but I went to seminary to go from having an inner knowing of what Norman was teaching was true to a knowing that I knew. I wanted to know objectively in the scriptures, and I knew that I needed the tools to be able to do that. Uh, but I really, I, it wasn't the doctrine that I was interested in. It was how to do exegesis, how to do interpret Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and so, you know, that's why I wasn't just overwhelmed. There were some places where I was influenced, and then a couple years later I realized, no, this can't possibly be true. I mean, there was a, for a while that I was convinced of the Calvinistic doctrine of God just predetermines who's saved and who's not saved, and then I it just... I got to the point where I could no longer worship God because any God that would predetermine that people would burn in hell forever apart from any choice they'd ever made was not a God that was worthy to be worshipped. He wasn't glorious. I worship the living God because he's the slain lamb from eternity, that he's the eternal self for others. He's not a God who desires to pour out wrath. He pours out wrath unwillingly because people won't repent and utterly refuse to, and he's left with no choice. Uh, it's not because he just made people sinful and then whacked them. Uh, but that's, that's the image that I got. Uh, and in fact, actually, that God was glorious in doing it. It's like, well, how is God? I don't know. I can't, I can't fathom it. Uh, and... It paralyzed my worship. I couldn't worship God anymore. So the other term that I'd like to talk about is the flesh. And, you know, as you know, uh, the NIV translates flesh, or at least used to translate flesh as sinful nature in Romans and Galatians. Uh, I believe that in two places it still does translate uh, uh, flesh as sinful nature in Romans 7, uh, 7 or 8. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, despite the fact that actually the NIV is, in many cases, a very, very good translation, uh, I can't recommend it because it's just very misleading, and it, it's a very important point. I don't believe flesh means that we have a rotten, corrupt, sinful nature uh, and, and that, that is gradually being sanctified. Uh, so what does flesh mean? Well, the Greek word sarx uh, is one of the most difficult words in the New Testament to translate. That, that's without doubt, and I think scholar, I mean, all New Testament scholars think that. Uh, it, it, words often have multiple meanings, and you have to discern what is the correct meaning in the individual context? And flesh is no different. Think of the English word rock. Now, think for a moment, what, what does that word mean? And how do you know what I mean when I say it unless I put it in the context of a sentence or a paragraph? 
A rock could be a stone. Or it could be a type of music, rock and roll. It could be, uh, it could be I'm using it as a verb to rock back and forth, like in a rocking chair. These are, it seem like totally different meanings, but depending on the context, you know what it means when you hear it in a sentence, or at least enough sentences to give you the context that provides the meaning. Words don't have meaning in themselves. They only have meaning in context, in a sentence, or especially in a paragraph. You usually have to read the whole paragraph to understand. Uh, now, I'm not going to do that with all the verses I'm going to, to read here, uh, but, but flesh is like that, and I have at least six different meanings, and there's, and there's more that I'm not necessarily going to go over. Uh, and I don't believe that sinful human nature is one of those choices. The most basic meaning in Greek, and I don't think it's found in this definition in, in the New Testament, but the original meaning in classical Greek is that it's the soft part of the body, the muscles and the fat, as opposed to the hard parts, your bones, so flesh and bone, or as opposed to the liquid parts, flesh and blood. So blood is the liquid part and, and, and the flesh is the other part. Uh, so that's probably the most basic meaning. And then what happens is that the term, because it's used in new uh, context, it, it, it acquires additional meanings. So by extension, because flesh is the soft parts of the body, flesh can mean the whole human body uh, or the human body and soul together. Uh, for example, Galatians 2.20, Paul talks about the life I live in the flesh, meaning the life I live in this body. And he doesn't, it, it's a neutral sense. Uh, uh, there's nothing necessarily sinful about it. Second uh, Corinthians seven one. Let me go there. Talks about, and I will probably refer to this a couple times. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to perfection in the fear of God. Well, if you can cleanse yourself from every defilement of flesh, and it's literally flesh there, but they translate it body, uh, which is a, a good translation because that's what he's meaning. The body is, uh, can be defiled by sin, polluted. If something is defiled or polluted, that means something is present that shouldn't be there. If I have a glass of water... Uh, and I offer you a glass of water to drink, but before I give it to you, I put a handful of dirt into it. The water's polluted. You're not going to drink it because the dirt shouldn't be in the water. You don't want to drink muddy water. You want to drink pure water. Uh, so the fact that he says that we can cleanse ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit means the flesh can be cleansed. The flesh is not a source of evil then. If the flesh were the source of evil and were rotten by definition, then it, it, it just would remain defiled. The, the command would be useless. Uh, so, and we couldn't then bring holiness to perfection in the fear of God. He, now the translation I'm here, here has com, uh, bring holiness to completion. Uh, but the New American Standard has perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Wow. So we can be free of defilement both in our body and in our spirit, both in our flesh and our spirit. And I think here flesh probably includes the soul. Uh, flesh, you see, as I view the soul, I view the soul really as a kind of function of the body. Uh, I see it as the kind of electrical signals in our brain and nervous system. You think about feelings, you feel them, you feel tension in your arms and your shoulder, and so you feel things. And we can connect thoughts to electrical signals between neurons in the brain. So there's a real connection between soul and body. And in the Old Testament, the word for soul there, nephesh, 
uh, re can refer to the life, the physical life of the body, what departs uh, when you die. You lose your phys at least the physical component of your life. Uh, so that's why I would include in the word flesh, sometimes it means body and soul together. Uh, Another verse uh, is 2 Corinthians 12, 7. He talks that Paul has a thorn in the flesh. It's not talking about a besetting sin there. It's not talking about a thorn in a sinful nature. He means it's something wrong in his body or in his body and soul, something he experiences there that he wants to get rid of, that it's suffering in his, in his body and soul. Uh, Galatians 4.13 talks about an illness or ailment or weakness of the flesh. Probably something was wrong with his eyes because the Galatians would have torn out his eye, their eyes uh, to help him. Ephesians 5.29, no one ever hated his own flesh. Well, that's his body. No one ever hated his own body. And Philippians 1.22, if I am to go on living in the flesh, in my in my body. Now sometimes uh, there's an emphasis when flesh means human body, emphasis on the mortal body. There's an emphasis on mortality and weakness because our bodies are mortal and weak. We're subject to death, and illness, and weakness. Uh, that, that's not sin. There's nothing sinful, but it is the result of our flesh, our bodies being fallen. Fallen doesn't mean sinful, it just means that we're, yeah, we're just, we're subject to the curse of the fall, our bodies. Uh, our bodies will dissolve back into dust, the dust from which they were created. And sickness is really a form of the power of death. Uh, and sometimes through prayer or intercession, we can beat back the power of death and speak against it because we already participate in the resurrection body of Christ and so we can call it forth, but that healing is temporary because this is a mortal body. And our mortal body, flesh and blood, don't inherit the kingdom of God. We won't, this mortal body cannot enter into the final kingdom of God. We have to receive a new resurrection body. We have to be transformed. So, let's, that get, so I've talked about uh, flesh is the, uh, as human body is the second uh, definition or body and soul together. So flesh by extension can mean the physical realm as opposed to the spiritual realm. And this is again in a, in a neutral sense. Uh, uh, in Romans 1, 3, and 4, Paul talks about how the son was descended from David according to the flesh. Well, nobody's going to accuse uh, Jesus of having a sinful nature. He who knew no sin he never sinned, so he didn't have a sinful nature. No, it just means by physical descent from the seed of David. Uh, it's the physical realm as opposed to uh, in Romans 1.4, he talks about how he's raised according to the spirit of holiness, raised in power. And that's, that's the, the realm of the resurrection body. The, uh, you know, we are sown in weakness, raised in power, and so we're raised according to the spirit. We'll come back to that idea in a little bit. Uh, so uh, another one is how, uh, you know, he talks about our Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. He's talking about Abraham as the physical ancestor of the Jews. Or Israel according to the flesh in 1 Corinthians 10.19. Physical Israel as opposed to spiritual Israel. That is, the, those who truly believe uh, Jew and Gentile are Israel according to the spirit. But flesh there me means physical Israel. Uh, the next definition, uh, this is definition four, uh, is, uh, is the merely human, flesh is that which is merely human as opposed to the divine, as opposed to the heavenly realm. And here is... Isaiah 31, 3, although it uses, well, I'll read it first. The Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. Now, I know it's talking about horses, but you could, 
it, the, the, the ideas are parallel there, that flesh, that which is merely human, and that which is flesh are the same, and that which is divine, or God, and that which is spirit are the same. So to be flesh is to be merely human or merely of this physical creation like horses. Uh, that's one, Isaiah 31, verse 3. I'm mostly sticking to Paul, but there are some cases where I will uh, refer to particularly Isaiah. Uh, now, in 1 Corinthians 3, Go there. No, I don't want that. Okay. Uh, Paul says, uh, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual but as fleshly, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even now you're still not ready, for you are still fleshly. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only like mere men? Wow. So fleshly equals acting as if you were mere men. Well, that means that the flesh is the merely human. It's not talking about uh, uh, you are still of the sinful nature. I mean, you could interpret it that way if you wanted to read a certain theological paradigm into the text. Uh, but rather, they're acting as if, and, and it, uh, you know, here is verse 4, where when sa one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being mere men? Are you not being merely human? Uh, now, it is, sort of, it is implied that this is sinful to act as mere men. Uh, but uh, the merely human, this leads to the next definition, is the merely human is humanity in a state of separation from God. That's the unbeliever. The unbeliever are in a state of being separated from God. Ephesians talks about how we were alienated from God in our minds or separated from God in our consciousness. And in this sense, there's a couple uses. Romans 7, 5 particularly. For when we were in the flesh, whoa, this were in the flesh, the sinful passions which uh, were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So were is in the imperfect tense. Verb tenses are very important. Were is a continuous state in the past, and it's no longer true in the present. Romans 5.8, when we were yet sinners. That means we're not sinners anymore. Even if I sin, I'm not a sinner anymore. Right. When we were in the flesh, well, that means flesh is no longer characteristic of me any more than old man is characteristic of me. So if I walk according to the flesh, I'm walking in a delusion. I'm walking as if I still were in the flesh, not that I still am in the flesh. It's a lie. Right. Right. Romans 7, the only chapter in the Bible that's a lie. <laughs> right. It's a lie. In Romans 8.8, 8, Paul says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That doesn't mean those who are controlled by a sinful nature or operating out of their sinful nature. No, it means we're not in the flesh anymore. And he says that in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh. Romans 8, 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ is not of him. 
In other words, you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not saved, and you're not a real believer, and so you're back, you're still in the flesh, and you can't please God. But we're in the spirit. So this is not who we are, he's saying. So if you think that you have a sinful nature, you're deceived, and you're going to act as if you had a sinful nature, and in fact, you're going to sin all the time because you're of your belief. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will cause yourself to sin by believing that you have a sinful nature. It's a license to sin, although I think in many cases, it's, people don't just don't know any better, and... And, and they believe this and they don't realize that they're actually causing themselves and giving themselves over to Satan uh, to sin. So let's turn to the phrases uh, living in the flesh and walking according to the flesh when it's a negative sense. If Romans 8.13, if you live according to the flesh... And walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit in Galatians 5. Uh, well, what does that mean? That's to, and, and this really where 1 Corinthians 3, you're walking as mere men. You are walking as if you were independent of Christ. So flesh doesn't mean you have a sinful nature. In this sense, it means you're walking as if you were separate from Christ. But wait a minute. Scripture says, I am joined to the Lord, and he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. When am I separate from Christ as a Christian? I'm not. So the only way that I can walk according to the flesh is because Satan has deceived me into thinking that I am separate from him, and I'm walking as if I were a mere man, like 1 Corinthians 3. That was the source of all the Corinthians' immaturity and all the sins that they did and the horrible things they did uh, that they were doing, and Paul was appalled by it. That's not proof. The Corinthians aren't proof that we have a sinful nature. It's proof that we can be de deceived and led astray, and we are pure virgins betrothed to Christ, and he's concerned lest the serpent lead them astray. And he did lead them astray. I mean, Satan led them astray. Uh, so it's not that they had a sinful nature. It's that they were deceived by the evil one. So let's, let me turn to... Uh, let's say Galatians 5. And this is probably the one that is the most, is seen as the most problematic. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 to 25. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires or the lusts of the flesh. Well, that seems to imply, oh, that flesh is this nature in us that has these lusts, these evil lusts, and we have to resist them by walking in the Spirit. And, and, and the way that this other paradigm in terms of, well, if we rely and trust in God, we will overcome the lusts of our evil nature. I don't believe that that's what it means. Because if you believe that you're that bad egg and you have evil desires and they're your evil desires, anything that you believe is you, you will eventually carry it out. You will eventually carry out whatever you believe is you. We see this in the whole identity movement, that people believe that they're gay, so they act out in, a gay, in, in homosexual behavior. Uh, it, 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 what we identify ourselves as has a direct correlation and effect on our behavior. So if we believe we have a sinful nature, we will sin. If we believe those lusts and desires are ours and our nature, we're going to carry them out. Before I go further in Galatians, I'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, which shows and exposes the connection between Satan and flesh. Ephesians 2.2, 2, or 2.1-3, to 3, And you were dead in, the, in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, the way that the world uh, acts, so we were all following, we were sponges uh, of, the, of the world. We, we just absorbed what everyone was doing around us, the spirit of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, and I mentioned yesterday, the air is inescapable and universal, and we just breathed in and Satan out like our spiritual atmosphere. We were in Satan, and Satan was in us. That's why he calls him the prince of the power of the air. Uh, uh, and the spirit, this, this is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So like John, who says, you are of the father, you're, uh, you're the devil, and his desires you do, the lusts are really Satan's lusts. It's Satan's desires. Uh, and then he says about the sons of disobedience, and this is key, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So because this spirit of Satan was operating within us, he stirred up passions in our flesh. And the passions in the ancient world were things like fear, anger, lust and covetousness, wrath, these things that get out of control, the appetites of the body. They're not, they're not bad in themselves, amazingly enough. Uh, there is a right time to be afraid. If you have a three-year-old child and they uh, walk out in front on a busy street and walk out in front of, a, uh, of traffic and they're in danger of dying, you know, the natural response is fear. I'm going to go and protect my child and grab them out of the way. You know, feeling fear in that context isn't a sin. That's an appropriate response. If you see injustice or wrong done to, some, to yourself or to another person, the immediate response is anger. Yeah. Of course you feel angry because that, that's just, you're supposed to feel angry. You're made to feel angry. God is angry when he looks and sees the way that people treat one another and the evil things they do. That's not wrong in itself. But Satan twists the passions and turns them into sinful things. He takes the normal sexual desire and twists it into unnatural lust or a desire to express that desire in ways that God is not designed. He designed it to be within the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, and uh, so that then he twists that and it's like, well, I'm going to use sexual desire to complete myself and take from other human beings and to feel complete. I want to feel pleasure all the time and, uh, and then take advantage and hurt other people and I don't care who I hurt. That's a spirit of Satan being manifested, misusing my normal human appetites. So it's very important to see the relationship between the flesh and the desires of our body and soul and how Satan misuses them and twists them. <coughs> now he does that uh, because Satan needs, a, he's a spirit and he needs a body to express himself through. And the only, he's rebellion against God. He needs a way to express that rebellion. So he needs bodies to do it through, to express that rebellion and rejection against God. Now, he's the self-for-self-spirit, but he can't express that self-for-selfness without human bodies to express it through. So he needs the lust, the appetites and desires of the body and soul to express himself through. He also needs the law, because without law, sin is dormant or dead. If he doesn't have any law to rebel against, Satan can't express himself. So he needs human bodies and he needs a law to express that rebellious self for self spirit. Because he, he opened up, the, God made a choice to be love in eternity, to be the slain lamb, to be the sacrificial self for others. Satan opened up the other possibility of just being for himself and me for me and I'm gonna do whatever satisfies and completes me into hell with everybody else. 
That's, that's the spirit of error. But he needs a, a divine law to express himself against. If we turn for a moment back to Romans 7, uh, he doesn't mention Satan directly here, but 7.5, while we were in the flesh, that is in this sinful condition, we were separate from, um, from God, from Jesus Christ, we had sinful passions aroused by the law which were work in our members to bear fruit for death. What he does describe in Romans 7, and I think Romans 7 uh, is, you know, was written probably about six to ten years after the time of Galatians. You know, he's developed a concept of sin. And most of my dissertation was focused on the concept of sin in Romans 7. What is it? He says, it is no longer I who do the sin, but the sin dwelling in, within me. And most interpreters take that follow St. Augustine, oh, well, that refers to my sinful nature, that, well, it's no longer I, it's my nature that does it. Well, then, it's still you. So how is it no longer you who do it? When I look at Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. Uh, it's obvious that Christ is a spirit, a person other than myself who's living in me and through me. Well, if I look at it's parallel, Romans 7, 17 is parallel to Galatians 2.20. It's, it's grammatically identical except for the fact that we have sin rather than Christ. So if Christ is a spirit that's dwelling in me, then sin is a spirit that's dwelling in me in my flesh. Uh, and here, of course, he's operating, Romans 7 isn't so much referring to the condition of an unbeliever, but it's Satan has, has gotten back into the body and is expressing himself through the body because of deception. Paul is thinking of himself separate from Christ. You'll notice from verses 7 all the way through 25, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned. So he's not talking about the way that we should walk. He's talking about what happens when we're deceived into believing that we are mere men. We are just ourselves. We are not joined to Christ. That's a deception. That's a lie, as Sylvia is fond of saying. It's the lie of Romans 7. Uh, so these verses... Uh, are not talking about flesh and old man and sin, are not talking about a sinful human nature. We're not the bad egg that's gradually, imperceptibly getting better and better. Uh, no, we're, we, are either, we either have the spirit of Satan or the spirit of Christ, and if we sin as a Christian, and, and, and we can sin as a Christian, it's very clear, if any man sin, in 1 John, uh, I think it's chapter 2. Uh, so it is possible for the Christian to sin. Uh, but we can only sin because we're deceived. We're walking as if we were independent of Christ. That's why you'll hear, if you listen to Sylvia or me or Louie or whoever for, among us for any length of time, you'll hear us talk about the lie of independent self. And, and it's really critical to get that, that the way we sin is because we, we buy into Satan's lie of an independent self. So the only way we can sin is through deception. Uh, so uh, I think that, I, don't know, I think I'm basically done. I finished quickly. Uh, are there any questions, maybe, uh, that people have? Okay. Yes. Okay. So he moves from deception into deliverance, and explain further what you mean. Right, exactly. Yes. 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 So Romans 7, that Paul is caught in sin, and he doesn't know why, 
why do I do the things that I don't want to do and I do the and I, I don't do the things that I want to do and he realized he comes to a revelation oh it's no longer I who do it it's sin dwelling in me that's a point of revelation to realize and it's very important to realize it really isn't you uh, uh, Sharon will give her testimony later on, probably, about how she realized at first, yes, she had to take responsibility for her sin, and then she, God showed her, but it really wasn't you. Uh, you never was you. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, uh, let me read the verse here. Uh, For I see in my members, 723, another law waging against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Members is the members of my body, my arms, my hands, my mouth, uh, my eyes. Uh, and, and so Satan doesn't get back into our spirit. We are one, joined one spirit with the Lord eternally. He can't get back into our spirit, but he can get back into the members of my body and misuse them, and he does that through deception. Misuse. Misuse. Right. So it's not the body that's a problem. As I said earlier about uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, about uh, flesh and spirit, uh, uh, or let me read that again. Uh, here. Uh, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit. Wait a minute. So that means flesh, if flesh can be defiled, that means it's not already defiled. It means that flesh, the flesh of a Christian, the body of a Christian, isn't the source of the problem. The source of the problem is something from outside. Like if I have a glass of muddy water, the mud, the dirt had to be introduced to the water to make it muddy. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Andrea? Yeah. yeah. Um, when it says that, like, when I try to do right, I find that people stay present with me. Uh huh. Can you that? Sure, sure. Well, evil is present there with me because I'm deceived. Isn't that because it's working out of self sufficiency? Yes. Sure. So it's like the good from the truth of evil? Sure, and that's deception. That when you're working out of self-sufficiency, which is a delusion, because you have no self-sufficiency, you're believing yourself to be separate from Christ and you're sufficient in yourself, then Satan is right there ready to take advantage of the situation. Because just as he said earlier in Romans 7, he, uh, 7.11, sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. It's like an enemy general that seizes a weakness in the enemy line and then he just pushes right through. And if there's a weakness in our belief, we believe something, his lie, he just presses right through and that's the evil that's right there with me and misusing my members because I don't believe the truth. Right. So the human doesn't have a nature at all. Right. It has no nature. It yeah. doesn't have an old nature or a new nature. Right. It has no nature whatsoever. Right. And to me, a nature, to me, is the power source of our being, what empowers us, right. you see. Right. But we don't have any. We have no power of our own. Here. Right, right. The old man is not an old nature, actually. Right. The old man is just, that's who I used to be, yeah. and the new man is who I am now in union with Christ. Yeah who I was in union with Satan, who I am now in union with Christ. So, right, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. 
Uh huh. Well, okay. Well, anger is not a sin. The person pulled out in front of you, and you know you're you're afraid of hitting them, uh, and then you're angry that they cut you off. And maybe they did it willfully in, in disregard for your life, or maybe they didn't. But you know, having an a, a, a initial response of anger is not sin. The, right. ba- the Bible says, be ye angry, and s- but sin not. Yeah. Sin not. Well, how do you sin not? Because you don't. Right. <laughs> yeah. This now, when is, we worship, you, we worship all, all with our body, soul, and spirit. And yeah. so sometimes we can feel like we're no longer worshiping because we had that reaction of anger. That doesn't mean we've stopped worshiping. It just means that our soulish emo- feeling changed uh, from a feeling of worship to a feeling of anger. Well, so what? That has not, we worship in spirit. That's what why, our soul does isn't really relevant. Yeah, that's why it's so important to know the difference between Absolutely. soul and spirit. Actually, we can't really totally move into intercession until we understand this. Yes. We really can't.